welcome to this review of my GMMK with box pink switches. Both this keyboard as well as the switches in it were donations, albeit from different sources. The GMMK was from a viewer in response to the IGK61 video I released a while ago, and the switches come straight from Novel Keys, who developed several of these click bar style box switches. I figured these two would combine perfectly in a review. Let's first look at the keyboard. The GMMK, short for Glorious Modular Mechanical Keyboard, was, or at least claims to be, the world's first hot swappable keyboard. That is to say, you can take out the switches and put in new ones without having to solder or desolder them. The idea is that it's easier to customize your board, of course, but also that it makes for a perfect test bed keyboard where you can try out different switches without a lot of hassle. This makes it perfect for my purposes, and it's also the reason why I bought the aforementioned IGK61 keyboard, which is also hot swappable. Because loose switches, or even just a switch tester, give a very bad impression of what it's actually like to use certain switches. The only real way to get a proper feel for switches is to use them in an actual keyboard, I found. I've previously done several videos, like Project K and Project N, where I simply desoldered an entire board to test switches, but as this more or less requires me to sacrifice a chassis every time I was testing something, I figured this was not ideal. The GMMK is available in several packages, including a TKL and a full size. You can order it with Gatoron or Kale switch packs and with or without keycaps. This was the full size bare bone edition, which means that it was really just a case and chassis and no switches or keycaps. This package retails for $60. A switch pack is an extra $30 to $35, and keycaps an extra $20 to $25, so the most expensive kit costs $120. The bare bone edition is perfect for me. As a test bed, the whole point is that I have switches of my own to test, of course, and I decked it out with a vintage set of very nice thick ABS double shots I still had lying around. Do please keep compatibility of the caps in mind. For example, it is set up for a non-stepped caps lock key, so OG Cherry double shot sets are not compatible, as those use a stepped caps lock instead, which has the stem in a different place. Similarly, it uses a center-mounted spacebar, so cherry spacebars, which are asymmetrically mounted, aren't compatible. In fact, I had no white spacebars of this size and symmetry left, so I stuck on a black one instead. Also, it uses cherry stabilizers, which are probably the most ubiquitous ones around, but it does mean that some other keycap sets won't be compatible either. This one is the standard ANSI version, although they did announce an ISO version recently too. I have very few ANSI boards, but thankfully it does fit the big ass enter key of this set, and the big ass enter key is my favorite anyway. The set you get when you order keycaps appears to be exactly the same ones that came with my IGK61. They're double shot ABS, so much more durable than the lasered caps that come with most backlit keyboards nowadays, but they use a stenciled font that's in my opinion not very attractive. This seems to be common on modern double shot keycaps for some reason. The vintage ones I put on them don't have transparent lettering of course, but they look much nicer in my opinion. But then again, I'm probably biased. <laughs> Another point of compatibility I found out straight away is that the board is incompatible with switches that have fixing pins, which are these things here. They're normally used for PCB mount projects, which includes most of Cherry's own keyboards, but if your PCB has holes in them, such as is the case in the IGK61, you can still use them on plate mount chassis. The fact that they either forgot to include the fixing pinholes in the PCB or deliberately chose to omit them is a serious mistake and it significantly limits the amount of switch types that you can use on these boards. It's possible to cut the fixing pins off of a switch, although this is a lot harder on switches with hard polycarbonate housings than on the softer black nylon ones, but I'd say that you really shouldn't have to mutilate your switches before you can mount them just because of this rather glaring oversight. The way the keyboard is marketed on the website and on the box also obfuscates this issue. In fact, I had originally intended this chassis to test Novel Keys' new cream switches, but because those use fixing pins, or at least these ones do, I couldn't. Guess these will be tested in the IGK61 in a future video. To my knowledge, box switches never have fixing pins though, so they work with it natively. I've seen some people say that box switches are a little bit on the big side for the holes, but as far as I'm aware, that's not true. I haven't had any issues whatsoever. Hot swappability is fast getting more popular, almost seeming like it's becoming a new standard, and there are quite a lot of keyboards nowadays that support it. 
prices vary widely. Some are much cheaper than the GMMK, which itself is priced at mid-level, while others, particularly with lots of extra metal parts, are considerably more expensive. The GMMK remains one of the most well-known hot-swappable keyboards, though. The keyboard is obviously marketed primarily at gamers, and specifically at the PC community, with their yellow Olympian deity logo, which I think is derived from a Zero Punctuation episode, where Yati talks about the glorious PC gaming master race, which is of course an accurate term as we all know. They even include a round sticker with the keyboard of this logo, stating, May your frame rate be mighty and your draw distance far, which I really like, although they were clearly careful not to piss off the dirty con console peasants too much with the whole master race, so they just called it Glorious PC Gaming Race instead. Either that or it's one of those American ultra-politically correct things, who knows. It also advertises itself as the gaming keyboard that does not look obnoxious, with a minimalist design, which on one hand I guess is somewhat true, but on the other hand this chromey rim on the keyboard, as well as the usual accompaniment of RGB Candyland says otherwise. Again, it really seems like they're trying to appeal to a lot of crowds at the same time. It strangely advertises itself as having full N-key rollover via USB or 6-key rollover, which makes no sense to me, but anyway, I tested it, and with me, it definitely seems like it has full N-key rollover over USB. Other gaming stuff magic bobs are full RGB, 100% ghosting, just like every other keyboard in history, and a 1000Hz polling rate, although I discover that this is switched off by default, and you need to enable it and switch it from 125Hz to 1000 in the GMMK software. Speaking of which, it uses a software package to more in-depth customize the lighting, set the polling rate, and also to program macros. Now, one thing that's very weird is that there is a different software package depending on your serial number. I've never seen that before, but presumably as a result, it's a very small file, only around 12 megabytes unpacked, which is a nice change. However, when I tried to program the missing backslash onto the menu key, which by itself is an anti-useful key to me anyway, I couldn't work out how to assign a macro to a key, and while the manual provides a link to another manual that should tell you how to do macros, I found that this links back to the same manual, which doesn't explain anything at all. So I haven't been able to get basic macros to work. I mean, how hard can it be to do macro keyboards properly, guys? They mastered this way back in the early 90s. In fact, the whole software package is super terrible. The lighting shown here doesn't even correspond to what's actually being done on the keyboard. Just uh, get this software bullcrap out of my sight. With switches and caps included, of course, otherwise it wouldn't be a very good comparison, the board weighs about 846 grams, which is very light for a full size. It's got a metal mounting plate, which, although it's aluminium, contributes significantly to the weight, as the case itself is very thin and light, and because it uses a so-called floating switch design, with no rims to protect the keys as well as having small, almost non-existent bezels, I say that the case doesn't offer that much protection from sideways knocks. At the back of the keyboard, they included the keycap puller, which is actually a really convenient place to put it, even though I've never seen that before, as well as a three-way cable gutter, always nice, and simple but effective flip-out feet with little rubber pads on them. Now, as for the switches, these are the real meat of the experiment, I guess. They're clicky switches that use the so-called click bar, a new clicker design developed by Kai Hua that I've been following closely ever since its inception, as I thought it had great potential. Originally intended for making low-profile clicky switches possible, Kai Hua later followed them up with two full-height designs, Kale Bronze, which was forgotten fairly quickly, presumably because of its colossal actuation click mismatch, and Box White, which served as the basis of several later modifications by novel keys. The first one was a stiffer version called Pale Blue, which wasn't bad or anything, but it didn't correct what I figured was the biggest issue with the white box design, namely the rather lacklustre tactility. This was followed by two more switches, Box Jade, which was the same as a white box switch, except they made the click bar thicker, and Box Navy, which featured the thicker click bar of the Jade switches, as well as the stiffer spring of the Pale Blue. As a result of the thicker click bar, which was changed from 0.25mm in diameter to 030 both of these switches became extremely tactile, possibly the most tactile keyboard switches on the market, which was, in my opinion, definitely an improvement, but perhaps a bit over the top. 
The stiffer springs of the navy switches in particular made the switches so heavy that I found typing them then to tire out my hands eventually, even if it felt quite satisfying somehow. Therefore, I suggested they try out a medium thickness click bar, and lo and behold, these box pink switches are right in the middle of the two at around 0.27mm according to the specs, and my own measurements of the click bars have confirmed something to that effect. To make for a nice side-by-side -side comparison, I therefore decided to include box whites on the F keys and box jades on the numpad to help with testing. So how do they feel? Well, the first thing that I immediately notice is that they definitely feel closer to box white than to box jade. So the tactility isn't super strong or anything, but it's definitely legit. Remember, more isn't necessarily better. But at the same time, there was definitely something that felt different about the pinks than either of the others. Namely, after the tactile bump, there is an appreciably more floaty feel left in the travel, if that makes sense. It's like the switch pushes back just a little bit more. Later, I found out why, they also included a slightly stiffer spring than those present in box whites and jades, which use the same lighter spring. The pink springs are still not as stiff as the ones on navies and pale blues though. In fact, they don't feel even as stiff as jades, because the tactile bump on those adds a lot of extra weight, but I still wouldn't call the pink switches light or anything. I've tried testing the switches a bit with the lighter springs from box whites, and in these cases the floaty feel disappears and the switches follow through much more after the tactile bump, just like with box whites and jades. I actually slightly prefer them modded like this myself, but when you're typing quickly, and even more so when you're gaming, the difference isn't that big to be honest. Either way, you can easily mod the switches in this fashion if you're so inclined. Another interesting difference is that the switches are less noisy than box white, jade and navy, at least as far as the click bar is concerned. In fact, particularly on the upstroke, it is noticeably less noisy than on the downstroke, which is a trait that click bar switches, as a result of their design, are otherwise inherently liable to. On box navy, jade and white, the upstroke is possibly slightly louder even than the downstroke, but with these box pinks there is a considerable difference between the two, let me show you. Apparently nothing in particular was changed to cause this difference, and it's still not exactly quiet on the upstroke or anything, but to some of you the slightly softer upstroke click may be a small advantage. Overall, I like their feel. They're a bit meatier than box whites, although they're not as crazy as box jade. They're a little bit on the stiff side. In fact, in terms of tactility and weighting, I found them to be somewhat similar to a Model M's buckling spring switches, to give you an indication, especially that little bit of resistance that's left after the tactile bump, which is why they feel fundamentally different from Alp switches, for example. I do like these better with the light springs, but still, they're good. Definitely among the better modern clicky switches in my opinion, and probably my favourite of the box switches. Now of course there's one thing you're all wondering about, how about the stems, do they still crack keycaps? Well, I've been relentlessly pestering Mike from Novel Keys with countless questions to get to the absolute bottom of this, so let's put this issue to rest once and for all. Originally, the stems weren't designed to be as thick, but Kaihua's first major customer for the switches, Dariu, asked for the x-axis of the stems to be made slightly thicker, 1.32mm instead of 1.30, so that they would fit more snugly. Kaihua complied, and the switches eventually entered the common market, still with the Dariu specs. However, it was found that in some cases, presumably those where the switch stems were on the thicker side of the tolerances, and the keycap ones on the narrower end, the switches would stretch and damage the stems and the keycaps. My own SA Dasher caps fell prey to this after they'd been used on my box navy keyboard, among others. Quite a few of the stems were damaged permanently, which is one of the reasons why I don't want to damage them further by swapping them on and off constantly. According to Mike, all old spec switches have since been pulled from the Novel Keys inventory, and he guaranteed that they now only sell switches with 1.30mm spec, which is actually a fraction thinner than Cherry's own specifications at 1.31mm. TTC and Greetech manufacture switches with the same thickness of 1.30mm, although they have different tolerances. 
Seth Colliner, a pretty sound bloke who now owns Key Chatter, and who happened to be my editor when I was still doing written reviews for Tom's Hardware, wrote a very thorough article on the subject which I highly encourage you to read for more information. It dives into great detail about thicknesses and tolerances, and methodically investigates and explores the whole topic. The only detail he got wrong was that the new retooled 1.30mm switches supposedly no longer have the nibs on the x-axis, which is what originally made them thicker. However, they do, and this was picked up in a desk authority thread where someone noted that the nibs were still present, but these nibs are now in spec. Note that I only know about Novel Keys' inventory. I have no idea if any other vendors of box switches sell retooled switches or not. Still, I have full assurance that any box switches sold by Novel Keys presently are at 1.30mm spec, which shouldn't harm any keycaps. So, to sum it all up, the GMMK is a decent, useful test board, although nowadays it's far from the only one capable of doing so. The box pink switches are nice clicky switches with some elements in key field that are reminiscent of a Model M, though not in sound, and the stem issue appears to have been resolved. Overall, I really like my time with this keyboard. It took a lot of time to do this project, but I think it was definitely worth it. That's it for this review. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.